What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're gonna take a look at the Ranchilio Silvia Pro X. If you enjoyed my previous content, if you'll go ahead and hit the like and subscribe. I know that many of you thank me for the reminder because it's easy to forget. If this is your first time on this channel, what's up? I'm Lance and we do some weird coffee stuff here. And today we're gonna take a look at this Ranchilio Silvia X. My friend Nicole Batfeld out of Germany who works with Ranchilio sent me her own special edition. The leopard print. and her beautiful signatures on the side. And anyway, I love this. My kid's obsessed with it because he loves leopards. Everything's the same. It just has a really cool, you know, jungle-esque theme about it. So I've spent many nights kind of diving into this machine. I like to spend months with my machines in order to really understand how they work and to kind of understand the limits of them. And if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that oftentimes I'm up till three or four in the morning testing these things. Now, some of you may be like, oh, lay off the coffee, but the reason I stay up so often is because I have a lot of trouble sleeping. I have insomnia. And on top of that, you know, I've been open about having ADHD, being neurodivergent. I also struggle with OCD, PTSD, and general anxiety disorder and all of that the, the way that I'm able to juggle it and juggle all of the kind of work I do out of that is by looking for therapy and that's why I'm excited to talk about today's sponsor which is BetterHelp. They're an online service that caters to all around the world and by answering just a few questions online you'll be matched with a therapist. This is a much cheaper and more accessible way in order to find therapy than if you were to rely on your geographical location which might have limited options and if you use the link that I have down below you'll receive a 10% discount on your first month. Now, of course, clicking that link does help this channel, but it can also help you. So if you're someone struggling with anxiety or with depression, or if you're just living in this world day to day with the economic hardships and just the stresses of everyday life, then I highly recommend checking out BetterHelp. It's helped me, it's helped my wife, and I'm confident it will help you as well. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this video, and let's get into this machine. For decades now, Ranchilio has been a staple on the home market. With their Sylvia that came out a couple of decades ago, it has been probably one of the most modded out machines in modern history. Now that kind of started in the early 2000s with when a certain person named Andy Schechter modded out his Ranchilio with a PID controller. Now this was the first time actually, shockingly, that a PID controller was installed on an espresso machine. And soon after commercial brands took after his lead and started to install them on their cafe machines. Over the years, many, many home baristas modded out their Ranchilios just like Andy in order to have that granular control over the temperature because they realized how important temperature control was over the extraction of the espresso. Well, over time, Ranchilio noticed this and they made the fix themselves. They added a PID controller on their Ranchilio Silvia Pro. And then over time, they added a dual boiler and now we have this dual boiler with a special feature called soft infusion, the Pro X. For the most part, it sits around that upper bracket of the 2000 US dollar area. They've kept it very simple, very minimalistic. You have four kind of toggle buttons on the front and you have an LCD screen with two little buttons on that as well. Now this menu controls a lot of different things, even though it just has two buttons. You have about nine menus on here that control the brew boiler temperature, the steam boiler temperature, a wake up time, a turn off time. You can control the amount of time for the soft infusion anywhere from off to six seconds. On top of that, you have a cleaning cycle, you have a drain the brew boiler cycle, and you have a drain the steam boiler cycle. You just kind of go through by holding down the two buttons for a few seconds. Once you see that it, the menu is on. So T2, we can just hit that and we have the steam boiler temperature. So you can go down, you can go up. You know, I just like to top it out at 125. I don't really see a need to go any lower. Then we can go back to that menu and you can toggle through all the different menus like so until you're back to T2. Now there's no T1 because just sitting here, you can control the brew boiler without having to touch the menu at all. Now, of course, the machine comes set at 93 on the PID controller, but it's very easy to just toggle up or down using the plus or minus buttons right there. If you have a brew actuator right here, you click down and it's kind of a bounce button. It starts, you click it, it stops. The on off button is not a bounce button. It's just kind of a toggle on or off. 
you have this which will actuate the steam boiler. You can actually turn it on and not have the steam boiler turn on so it will draw less energy and it takes a lot less time to heat up. If you're someone that is mostly doing espressos and maybe occasionally a cappuccino, you can keep the steam off. If you watch, this light shows that the steam boiler is on and it's heated up and it's good to go. But I can turn that off very easily by clicking the steam button. Now this light is off and that steam boiler will just cool down. The memory will save whatever setting was last used on the machine. So now if I turn it off and back on, this will be off and it will only heat up the brew boiler. Heating up the brew boiler, I timed it yesterday, it gets to temperature in just three minutes. If you want everything nice and heated up, maybe six or seven minutes. Flush it once or twice and you're at full temp ready to go in under seven, seven-ish minutes, which is really nice. So if you're someone that drinks espressos mainly, you can just keep the steam function off until you need it. Just flip it on and it'll take an extra 15 or so minutes to fully heat up, get to full pressure for that steam wand to be ready to go. In order to use the, the hot water tap, you have to have that steam boiler on because the hot water is drawn from the bottom of the steam boiler. This machine has been lauded for its durability, longevity, its quality of build for the price point. Of course, this one is kind of getting up there. I've seen some critiques that the Sylvia was originally, you know, like 800 US dollars. They just added a steam boiler in this and a PID controller and charged a thousand extra bucks. When you look at things like that, then you kind of have to question all pricing and all margins and that's just kind of where we're at. When you're looking at dual boilers though in this price range, you really only have this and kind of the Breville dual boiler that are kind of punching above their weight or, or giving kind of some of the capabilities that these have. Of course, the Breville dual boiler has more control on it out of the box than this does. There are a lot of people who just prefer kind of Italian based company where it has a little bit more stability on the inside, on the inside parts. This does cost a little bit more, but a lot of people feel that that's worth it. Now, one thing I want to go ahead and hit is this soft infusion that Rancilli was so excited about when they launched it. This is an alternative to pre-infusion, which as I've said in previous videos, doesn't really mean much. It's just saturating the puck at different levels, at different pressures, but they, they kind of draw a distinction between pre-infusion and soft infusion. And what they do is instead of running the pump in order to fill the puck, they're just letting ambient pressure fill the puck with a trickle of water. And they allow this up to six seconds before the pump kicks in. But this is not the same as something like on the Breville dual boiler, which actually does a percentage of pump pressure. Let me explain why I'm not a fan of soft infusion. Soft infusion to me is kind of uh, not helpful. In fact, I think it's kind of counterproductive to a good extraction. So what you have with pre-infusion, and I've said in previous videos that pre-infusion is kind of a misnomer. It doesn't really make sense. But in other machines like the Breville dual boiler, where you have complete control over the pre-infusion, you are using certain varying degrees of pump pressure in order to fill that puck with water forcefully to the bottom of the puck from top to bottom. Soft infusion is purposefully the opposite of that. They're using ambient pressure, so not using the pump, in order to sprinkle water over the puck as a pre-wetting phase. That means water is just kind of sprinkling out to fill the gap between the puck and the shower screen. So six seconds is kind of the limit. You can't really go over that because once it's over that, the water is going to have to enter the system of the machine because the pump's not on. And there's not enough force with just ambient pressure to push that water through the puck and out the bottom. You are slowly wetting the puck from top to bottom. So the top portion will be saturated, but once that ambient pressure is no longer able to push the water through those finely packed grounds, well, the bottom part's just gonna be dry until that pump kicks on and you're gonna have a big gradient of ready to extract on the top and not ready to extract on the bottom, probably giving you consistently uneven extractions in comparison to what they arguably could be if you just went at full nine bar or if you had actual kind of pump pressure pre-infusion. The desire to be different and the inability of using a potentiometer since Breville has that patented, this doesn't really sell me on a really nice feature. You have FO8, you click, where at six seconds, you can go down to off, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds. It starts off with ambient pressure. See, that's just kind of trickling out. You don't really hear anything. And there goes the pump pressure. Okay, kind of like if you were to just pour water into a flare and let it sit there. The water is gonna wet the top portion, but it's never gonna make it through the puck because there needs to be some sort of pressure in order to saturate the full puck. 
Now, of course, when people are buying this machine, they're not buying it for the soft infusion. They're buying it for the build quality, the reliability, the brand reputation. They're buying it for the purported thermal stability as well as the ease of use. Like I said, just the simple buttons up here. There's not really any faffing around to get your shot. It's simple, you fill it up, you hit go, and it fills the boilers and it's ready to go. I'm gonna hit that thermal stability test. We're gonna check it out with my uh, temperature reading device in order to see how it goes over long periods of time to see if, you know, it's actually hitting that massive thermal stability since it has a semi-saturated group. All right, so I'm gonna be using the Passato temperature and pressure reader in order to kind of observe the temperature and how it changes throughout the shot. I've pointed out in the past, there's an inherent flaw in the design of this where there's a big cavity in the basket and there's nothing there to emulate a puck. So what I've done is I just ran one shot through in order to put some hot water into the puck where the thermoprobe is. This does actually have very similar readings to this case. Once you do something like this, that water kind of acts as a pseudo puck. It will absorb some temperature. Then we're gonna be able to kind of follow the temperature as it continues on. We're at 87 degrees to begin with and here we go. Now a nice thing about this machine is this LCD screen does double as a timer as the shot is going which I do appreciate. So here we are we're building up the temperature we had to change that you know cooling water to hot water so we're up to about 90 degrees. Need to open this valve up a bit it's a little too close a little restricted there we go. So we're building up 91.6, 91.7, 91.8, 91.2. .1, and what I've noticed is over time, it does continually raise in temperature, but it never gets you know egregiously high unless you do multiple back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to shots. So as you see, we're at 40 seconds and it's at 93.3. I'll go ahead and stop it because that's a longer shot than most people will pull, though we are approaching 94 degrees. In the user manual, Ranchilio does recommend you know clearing out the group head after every uh, after every shot or before every shot, so that you can you know optimize your thermal stability. So we're actually we will go ahead and pull this. We'll purge it real quick. All right, so now we're at 87 inside the basket, and we're going to go ahead and hit it again. So we're climbing immediately. We're up to 90. Mm. We started to climb, now we're going down, now we're going back up. All right, there we go, 91, 92. We're shooting up to about almost 93. So we had to convert that cooler water to hot water. All right, so now we're over 93, which obviously means hotter water than 93 is coming out, but it's stabilizing, uh, it's getting, you know, it's finding where it wants to be, 93.7, 93.8. Climbing a bit, 93.9, 94. We're at about 30 seconds on the clock, and we're at 94, 94.1. And this is consistent with all the temperature testing I've done off screen. It does just slowly increase as the, as the time goes on. Nothing egregious, but we are about at 1.3 degrees over our set temperature. But of course, we're at 45 seconds now. So as we keep going, 94.5. All right, so we let it cool down to around 91 degrees. Now I'm gonna hit it one more time for our final little test. We'll let it run to around 45 seconds again. Here we go. Good. So this time we're running up pretty hot. We're up to 95 already. 95, 95.5, 95, 96, 95, 7, 95, 8, 95, 9, 96, 96, 1. My cup's about to overflow. 96.2, we're at 32 seconds. 96.3, we're at 40 seconds at 96.4 the temperature does continually to increase. So over time, it does increase. The stability does not rival that of the Breville dual boiler, at least in my testings, but it is passable, especially on the first few shots. But as the machine continues to pull and to draw water through it, that temperature just continues to kind of increase and increase and increase and increase. Now, something I saw on some home barista threads, that is a great resource for people who are just getting into espresso machines, but I saw some people saying that they were having issues extracting lighter roasted coffees, that they were coming out sour, even at the highest temperature temperature possible and we're curious if the temperature was actually hitting those higher temps and that was like kind of confusing to me and I'm wondering if uh, perhaps these people were using soft infusion it was causing under extraction because of the gradient in that puck uh, instead of the temperature because the temperature is fine if not a little too high of course we did see a trending upwards but that should actually help with lighter coffees uh, to abstain from those sour extractions a big thing that does really irk me on this machine is the drip tray now 
it's first off, it's very small. It feels like it was an afterthought the way it's made. So you just have kind of a cover that doesn't let you see where your water level is at. There's no indicator that you have too much water in the drip tray at all. When you take it off, as you can see, it just feels, I don't know, it just, it's just bent over metal and it's just, it, it doesn't feel that great. It doesn't look that great. Now this is by far the worst part is the tray itself. So if it's really full, you have to tilt it in order to get it out. If it's really full, you're immediately spilling water out the back. You have to lift the machine and clean it out. Looks like a, a, a cafeteria tray for a, a prism system or something. Let me go dump this real quick. They do have the capability of raising the drip tray so that if you only do espresso or something, you can raise it up higher. It's just a little janky, I feel like. I guess it does the job. It just doesn't do it super well, in my opinion. Now, since we have the machine at temperature, I'm going to go ahead and pull a shot and I'll pull one with soft infusion, one without. I'm just going to kind of show you how the puck reacts under same timing, etc., with the two of them. So this first shot is with no soft infusions. So just straight to nine bar. Here we go. All right, we had Channel City, but keep in mind this is a light coffee, so the viscosity is not there to hold back the inevitable channelings that are happening in darker roasted coffees. So don't come at me in the comments. All right, let's do one with the soft infusion. And here we have soft infusion up to six seconds with the same grind size, same dose, everything else. Here we go. So as you can hear, you don't hear anything. And it's because water's just barely going over the puck. And there we have the full pressure kick in. And there it finally comes. So as you see, but the time between the pump kicking on uh, and the soft infusion is about the same as when you didn't have the soft infusion, which means that water's not really penetrating the puck at all. So we'll see when this shot ends. It's obviously going to take about six seconds longer. And there we are to get 45 grams out in 34 seconds. Looking at it visually, the crema on the no infusion is, is darker uh, and the other one's lighter, which might signal there was more channeling in the soft infusion. But again, they both channel a lot. It's a lighter roasted coffee. That's not a good test anyway. Obviously I know what each one is. No soft infusion. Soft infusion. They claim that the soft infusion mutes some of the acidity um, because of that pre-infusion stage. I actually argue that a lot of times it makes the cup harsher because it has such a stratified extraction going on throughout the espresso puck. Now let's, uh, let's move on. The steam one on here, it doesn't get to a super high pressure. It's at 1.3 bar, which doesn't necessarily help you pr crank out tons of big milk beverages, but this isn't supposed to be a commercial machine. I think it's more than fine steam power for the home user at 125 Celsius. And once you get the initial water out, it's actually pretty dry steam. It does a good job steaming up your milk. And since you can control the steam power, if you're into alternative beverages like almond or soy or oat or something like that, and you prefer to steam it at a lower temperature due to uh, just the way it steams up, you found in your experience, you can always lower the steam temperature. It's got a really nice ball joint and it has a long enough arm that you can really get it on out here to help you get that halfway and a quarter position that you should be using when you're steaming milk. It's not an insulated steam wand, so be very careful grabbing it. It has this little joint here so that you can kind of move it around without being burned and it is faster than the Breville dual boiler, has more power. Before we end, let's open the machine up and take a look at the internals and then we'll wrap up. I have taken out the water reservoir. As you see, this is it. And it's very simple, just a plastic lid, which I'm not a fan of. It looks kind of ugly on top, but can't be too picky. As you see, there's no feeding from the bottom. Instead, they use a kind of uh, floater uh, and, and their intake system just like this. So they're able to tell the water level, et cetera, using these, these bad boys. And that way it's just kind of attached to the back. You don't have the valve on the bottom like a lot of other machines do. You just have six screws on top. So we'll get those unscrewed. Now, if you take that top off, you have full access to the middle and you can even emulate like people off of Monty Python that go, oh man, oh man, oh no, no. 
or you, you don't have to do that. So when you open it up, you have the brew boiler right here. And so this is obviously insulated, which is really nice. And then for the high pressure systems, they opted for brass wiring, which does a really nice job. Water is fed into the brew boiler to go into the brew group head, which is just below the boiler itself, which gives it nice thermal stability. Over here, you have the steam boiler. And then of course you have the feeding into the steam wand here. And then you have the tube here that feeds to the hot water spigot from the bottom of the steam boiler where the loose water is. Then over here we have the solenoid valve, which is in a great position to easily replace if and when it does fail. So the vibratory pump is down here. They're cheap to replace. So it's also something that will likely fail over time and you'll need to replace it. But there's plenty of videos online on how to replace that. And it's pretty, it's pretty easy to do as well. So overall on the insides, they have nice quality parts in the areas where it needs it on the places that it's not as, uh, needed, they, they opted for cheaper material, which is completely understandable. This isn't a La Marzocco price point, so it's not filled with La Marzocco quality. Uh, so you can't expect that at, you know, a third of the price point. I think the machine's probably a little bigger than it needs to be. It's pretty long, uh, but it, it keeps a pretty narrow profile. It does the job, easy to repair, easy to maintain, all mostly off the shelf parts that you can buy in order to make any changes that are necessary. But there shouldn't be any changes needed for a while, especially if you maintain your machine well and you clean it using the program cleaning cycle in here and you're using treated water into the water tank itself so you're not forming a lot of scale deposit on the insides. Now, something that I have noticed is some of the screw holes on the top are very thinly threaded and I, mine, one actually came already stripped. And so there's kind of like a, it's just not held on very well right here. Uh, something else that I kind of noticed is there's a little bit of play in the group head itself, like some vertical bouncing, that's not ideal. Maybe could cause an issue. Granted, this has only been out a couple of years. I did see online someone else talking about this issue and how they didn't have it in a previous model of the Sylvia or the Sylvia Pro. Genuinely, the machine is good. I, I nitpick in these reviews because these this is not a, not a cheap amount of money. Um, the, I would say that the serviceability and the lifetime of this probably will outlast a Breville dual boiler. And I know that there are a lot more issues out of the box with Breville's than there are with wrench. Chilios. They're not big enough to warrant a pallet monetarily, so they come kind of in a box and in the shipment I've seen that there have been some issues and a lot of replacements have had to been made, but uh, a lot of these resellers, you know, take care of their people. So I will say there's an incredible modification you can make to turn on and off the uh, the pump, uh, which Tate Mazer, a friend of mine and fellow YouTuber, has made a video. I'll link that just above as well and put it in the description below where you kind of take uh, one of these buttons and you make it into a double button and you can kill the pump mid shot in order to allow for uh, something similar to an E61 where you can kind of uh, in, uh, like bring the pump on so that you can properly pre-infuse the puck, kill the pump so it doesn't continue. You can let it saturate and bloom. Then you can turn the pump back on without unseating the puck uh, through the solenoid valve. Is it worth the price? Well, that's obviously always up to you, the consumer. I think it does a great job. Yes, the temperature does rise, but I don't think that warrants any you know massive stress. The drip tray is obviously not ideal, but that's such a small thing uh, unless that's you know a huge issue of yours but um, I don't think that's a big thing steam wand is powerful enough to get the job done and it's very easy to get on the inside and to change things out you know that whether or not aesthetically it's for you that's up in the air I do love my leopard print coating on this but of course this is a signature model I'm sure you can get some, if you if you really want to have this you know this feline look. I'm sure you could get some sort of wrap to wrap yours out. I like it. I give it a stamp of approval. I think it's a good machine. I think you are going to be making great espressos at home if you have one of these, especially since you can turn on that brew boiler in isolation from the steam boiler. I think that's a brilliant thing to help lessen the power draw because as we know, boilers draw a lot of power and that's why so many machines are turning to thermoblocks, thermojet technology because it draws a lot less power. I do wish it came with a naked portafilter in the box. It only comes with the split shot and um, the, the brush for the group head is not very great. So you might want to buy one independent of that. But everything else about the machine is good. If Gaja Classic Pro were ever to release a dual boiler, it would be similar to this. I think that's it for me today. Uh, if you enjoyed it, you know, again, please hit that like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Tell me what you think of the machine. And I want to thank BetterHelp once more for sponsoring the video. Anyway, that's all for me. I hope that you brew something tasty today. And cheers.